you tell them a life story and et cetera. But by getting all that biographical information and going to the county welfare offices, they were able to identify these individuals, full name, you know, place of birth, that type of thing. He presents this to me one day and says, prove to me these are not Vietnam veterans. Well, by that point, I had learned, how, and I'll mention this in a minute, I learned to use the Freedom of Information Act to get a military record. So we get their, their military record. Only a small minority had ever been in the military. None of them were Vietnam veterans, but every single man that had been in the military had a bad conduct discharge. We have a metropolitan area in the North Texas area, about five million. There was one individual, a Marine, who was homeless on the street that had a felony conviction as a youth offender. You can't get in the military typically with a felony. He'd gotten a waiver. He'd gotten in the Marine Corps. He did go to Vietnam, and he slugged out his commander and got a dishonorable discharge. He was able to find exactly one out of a population of five million. Now, the veterans advocates love, or, or the homeless advocates love, you know, raising money by telling us all these homeless veterans are on the street. I'll make you a bet not one of those advocates has ever bothered to get a military record. And when I first discovered this thing about the military records, I was, you know, going down these statistics, uh, you know, the suicides. I went to the Center for Disease Control. I went to the VA, because every time a veteran dies, they get, they get word of it. Uh, the reality is <clears throat> the Vietnam veteran had a slightly higher suicide rate the 18 months after they came home. Since that time, it has been lower than the average of our peer group that never went in the military. And interestingly enough, I, I looked into the World War II generation. In World War II, in 11 months in Europe, 1,300 GIs killed themselves. Um, oh, yeah, but there are hundreds of thousands of guys in prison. Well, I went to the Bureau of Prisons. They have keep statistics on their inmates. There were a million uh, men in prison at the time, but there were only 57,000 were, who were of the age where they could have been Vietnam veterans. But in that group, 55% of them were black. Only 10% of Vietnam veterans were black. The vast majority of them, almost three quarters, did not have a high school degree. 90% of Vietnam veterans do have a high school degree. A, almost three quarters of them had felony convictions as youth offenders. And as I mentioned, you can't get in the military with a felony. And most of them came from broken homes, either one parent or no parent home. The vast majority of Vietnam veterans come from a two parent home. My conclusion was, and it's obviously not scientific, but uh, I, I defy anybody to significantly challenge it, that there were no more than 3,500 Vietnam veterans in prison. Pick a crime, you will find a Vietnam veteran in, in prison for that crime. But again, that's one of the largest, uh, that's the smallest incarceration rate of just about any group. I usually make a joke saying there are more police officers and former congressmen in prison than there are Vietnam veterans. Um, the big item was the race, the unfairness of the draft. And this was interesting because, again, I, I was getting the World War II statistics and matching them up with the way it was versus Vietnam. The reality is, in World War II, 50 million men were registered with the draft. And I grew up believing every able-bodied man served. The reality is, only 5 million of those men voluntarily enlisted. Over 20 million were sent draft notices. More than half of them flunked the aptitude test or the physical. The manpower problem got so bad early in the war that the federal government let 100,000 felons out of prison with the deal that if you survive and get an honorable discharge, you'll get a pardon. The, uh, the draft in, in, Viet, in uh, excuse me, uh, Vietnam, there were 9 million men that served. There were only 2 million drafted. We had a volunteer rate that was two and a half times greater than the World War II generation. And yet they're the volunteer army and we're the draftee army. Where that ever came from, I, I don't have a clue. Oh, but uh, you know, 20,000 that killed in action were 18 year old draftees, mostly black. I got the breakdown of that among the casualties and this shocks everybody. The number of 18 year old draftees who died in Vietnam was 101. Not 10,000, not 100,000, 101. Of those, only 17 were black. The number one age to die in Vietnam was 20, then 21, then 22, then 23. The draft starts from the top down, not the bottom up. 
every draft board. Now the 25 year old is more likely to be in graduate school or to have a family or to be married. I mean, you know, where you're trying to work your way down. And so the median would be in the 20 to 23 year uh, range. And those are the ones that suffered the casualties. James Fallows wrote a famous piece where he said that if the children of these wealthy communities were dying in Vietnam, the war would be over almost immediately. And he named places like Chevy Chase and Beverly Hills. Guess what? Old James didn't do his homework. I got the figures, and in three of those towns, the per capita death rate was higher than the national average. Gregory Peck's son served in Vietnam. Jimmy Stewart, Beverly Hills, his son was killed in Vietnam, was awarded a silver star. Uh, MIT did a study on the breakdown, the social economic breakdown of the casualties, putting it in thirds. How many of the casualties came in the upper third of the social economic strata? Well, it was less. It was 26%, but nowhere near what we've been led to believe, that they were completely avoiding going in the military. It all fell on the bottom third was the story. Well, guess what? They suffered 30% of the casualties rather than 33%. Where the, where the heavy weight fell was in middle-class white America. The middle class suffered 44% of the casualties in Vietnam. I looked into all of the uh, disciplinary statistics. In Vietnam, for the total of 12 years of war, there were 250 desertions. 90% of those were for personal problems, had nothing to do with protest against the war. 10% of them were definitely protest against the war. When the Battle of the Bold started World War II, there were 20,000 American soldiers in deserter or AWOL status in Paris alone. And in terms of uh, Vietnam, not a single unit ever surrendered to the enemy, not even down to a squad. World War II, you had entire regiments surrendering the second the Germans showed up without firing a shot. 97% of the men who served during the Vietnam era got a honorable discharge, which is exactly the same rate as the 10 years before the war. But also, interestingly enough, the Vietnam veterans segment of that had half the desertion rate of the Vietnam era veterans. Atrocities, ah, but you Vietnam veterans were killing every civilian you ever ran into. What has always interested me about that, it touches a little bit on what Mark was talking about. The South Vietnamese government had a completely functioning government. They had an army there much bigger than we had. They had a police force. We ourselves had thousands of attorney criminal investigators. You didn't just touch the head on a civilian and not have somebody and have some repercussion. Now, I'm not saying there was never a crime that wasn't reported or somebody didn't get charged, but the vast majority of them did. There were a uh, little under 300 American GIs that were charged with capital crimes, mostly you know, against civilians, but they were individual acts. Now, the one that always stands out is me lie, and it obviously absolutely happened. But I, I'm not, can't, I don't have time to get into that, but that was not a standard unit. It was a unit, part of which was formed at Fort Hood when I was there, and everybody got, every unit got an allocation to send so many veterans from your company. Well, every company commander is going to send him his worst people. Sergeant, are they, they court martial Jones yet? Stop that. He's going. They then got to Vietnam, and they all were there at the, in the same day, so they were going to come home the same day. So they'd take 300 of those in the AmeriCal division, which was Cali's division, and send it to the first cab. Guess which 300 do you think the first cab sent back? They sent back their problem children. It was a situation without strong leadership, there was going to be a problem. And every time the Army has formed a unit like this in Korea, World War II, or what, they have had a spike in disciplinary problems with that unit. That is also why you have major people who have served in that unit. Colin Powell served in that unit. Schwarzkopf served in that unit. I don't mean Cali's particular company. I'm talking about the AmeriCal Division. They would put in strong leadership to take control of the, the rebel rousers. Uh, but